Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one entitled Preparation for the End Time. I wonder when that's going to be. Hmm. We're going to study this time lesson number two in that series for April 14 of 2018 entitled Daniel and the end time. So you can guess we're going to focus on the book of Daniel in the Bible. So I hope you have your Bible handy, open the book of Daniel, and we'll get ready to start. But we always, as usual, start with prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we know that this book of Daniel has been challenged. So many people have reasons to, to believe that it couldn't just couldn't be possible that this is a true book, and yet it reveals so many wonderful things about you that we, we cling on to it, we hold on to it with, as a precious treasure. Help us now as we explore just a few passages from this book to recognize its great wealth of material for us. May we learn more about you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> it shouldn't be any surprise to those who have studied their Bibles that ancient Israel did not fulfill God's plan for it. What was God's plan for ancient Israel? To expand into all the earth. Yeah. They were put at the center crossroads of the world, and they were supposed to spread the gospel to everyone around them, welcoming the Gentiles in by convincing them to believe in the truth about God. Well, what ha where did they end up? They ended up as in Egypt. 100 years at least of slavery in Egypt, and they thought, okay, it's all over. But then God stepped in, and what did he do? He them. rescued them from Egyptian bondage and through those plagues and crossing the Red Sea and the Jordan River and so forth and the miraculous victories. But a few hundred years later, about a thousand years later to be exact, um, what happens? They have fallen apart. The northern kingdom has been conquered by Assyria and scattered to the winds. And then the southern kingdom of Judah has been conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. Actually, he conquered it three times. So where are we going to go next? This is a serious problem for the children of Israel. Being, cap being in captivity and even in slavery in Babylonia caused a lot of concern among the Jews. Maybe not for the reasons you would have immediately thought about, although those were real reasons. But in ancient times, it was commonly believed, not necessarily among the Jews, but commonly believed that each god had been assigned to a particular territory. So if you want to worship the god of Judah, you have to be in Judah to worship the god of Judah in order to pray for him, to pray to him. So if you're way over in Babylonia, if you pray, will God hear you? Of course, we know that God hears people no matter where they are, under what circumstances, but this was a huge issue for the children of Israel back in, in those times. Well, Ezekiel in the, the vision of the wheels within the wheels that of God coming to them was kind of a, an assurance that he, actually he was with them. He wasn't just over there somewhere. Exactly. Well, there's a very interesting little passage that illustrates this. If you remember the story of Naaman, the captain of the Assyrian of the Assyrian host, I'm sorry, and they he captured a Jewish a maid. I don't know exactly what the circumstances were there, but she said, you know, you've got this leprosy, and if you would go to Israel, you could be healed, and all that stuff. Anyway, when he went to Israel, um, Elisha refused even to see him. He just says, go down and wash seven times in the Jordan River, and he didn't want to because he said, the rivers back in Damascus are much better than the Jordan, and so forth and so forth. But then this is what happened. Naaman insisted that he, he, he tried to give Elisha a gift, but, um, yeah, but he, wouldn't, he would not. So Naaman said, if you won't accept my gift, then let me have two mule loads of earth to take home with me. Why would he want to do that? So he could worship the God of Israel. Because from now on I will not offer sacrifice or burnt offerings to any God except the Lord. So I have to worship him on his territory. 
So I hope that the Lord will forgive me when I accompany my king to the Temple of Rimmon, the God of Syria, and worship him. Surely the Lord will forgive me. And I, I think we're going to probably be, meet, meet Naaman when we get to heaven. I think he probably understood and appreciated what God did for him. Well, fortunately, Daniel and his three friends, because that's what we're focusing on today, after arriving in Babylon, were not concerned at all about whether or not God could hear them way over there in Babylon. It was a foreign country, they knew that, but they came, became tremendous witnesses to the nation, in fact, to their entire nation, uh, even though they, were, they basically did what Israel was supposed to have done hundreds of years earlier. So now while we recognize that Daniel and his three friends lived in very different times and circumstances than we do, what can we learn from their stories? Well, I'm almost reluctant to tell you this, but there are critical scholars who think that the, the miracle stories in the book of Daniel are just fairy tales. You know, everything comes out right in the end, that's a fairy tale. But we know that these are true stories, and that they're very important in teaching us a lot of things. Um, look at Luke 16, 10. Whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. Now, what does that have to do with our story? Well, let's think about this for a minute. What happened in Daniel 1? requested a diet that didn't... Okay, well, first of all, Nebuchadnezzar went to Judea. He conquered the country, and he said, now I need some people to take with me to represent Judah in my kingdom. So give me the very best young men you have available. And some Daniel and his friends were probably from the royal family. And they were taken off to Babylon, and the rest of what we read as Kerry started to tell us is what happened? Well, they never lost the courage of their convictions. They saw what the king was eating and it went through past his idols, this kind of stuff, and they wanted no part of that, so they asked for a special diet, which they'd probably been raised on yeah. all along. Mm -hmm. So what was, remember, what, what did Daniel do? Oh, he asked for special exemption. Yeah. He asked, for, and who did he ask? The one who was overseeing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that person was really worried because he thought, if you're going, if you eat the king's special food and he drink his wine, surely you're going to be better off than any other diet you could imagine. So, and if it turns out that that you look worse because of that, they might cut off my head. And so what did Daniel suggest? A trial. Try it, Try it Try for it. 10 days. Now how much difference do you think they would be able to see in 10 days? Shouldn't be much, but uh, apparently it was. It was probably a miracle. But on the other hand, I think it's fair to, re to think that Nebuchadnezzar and his higher ups, they were probably drunk half the time and these lads wouldn't be. Yeah. Right there, there's I a difference. I think that may be a major part of it. Now, you've already hinted at a couple of things. Not only was the food that Daniel was asking for healthier, but it had not been, vegetables were not offered to the pagan gods. And it was assumed if you ate the food that had been offered to the pagan gods, you were worshiping those pagan gods. So any success they would have in the future would be attributed to the pagan gods. So that may have been an even bigger reason for Daniel to refuse it than the fact that it wasn't the healthiest thing to eat. It's interesting, I just was curious in studying this, turns out that um, the word in King James which says pulse, which we usually say that means vegetables, that's exactly the same word that's used for Adam and Eve's diet in the Garden of Eden. And what was that diet? Roots, grains, and nuts. Yeah. Not vegetables? Nope. Th that's no vegetables. Those are sinful. S vegetables weren't introduced till after the fall. So there may have been more than just vegetables in Daniel's diet. Well, anyway, whatever. 
they ate healthy, and we know they, they were more incredibly blessed and, and did very well. God obviously worked closely with Daniel and his three friends repeatedly on different occasions. Would he not have worked with the entire country or the nation of Israel way back when they were in Palestine if they had been faithful? Of course he would have. What about us in our day? Is God willing to work with us? Do I need to ask? Are we carefully adhering to the truth in the Bible, the writings of Ellen White? Are we being good witnesses to those around us? Those of us who live here in Loma Linda live in a place called the Blue Zone. What's the Blue Zone? Doesn't mean it's covered with bl the blue haze of cigarette smoke. I can guarantee you that. What's the, the Blue Zone? The Democratic? Democratic? Oh, it's in those, no, parts of the world. <laughs> those parts of the world where people generally live a lot older, 10 years or so. Some of them live even longer than that. Four places. Someone was set out to, to research this, and he picked out four places in the world where people lived longer. And the only one in the only one of those places in a relatively civilized country, you know, was Loma Linda. Yeah, well. So why do Seventh Day Adventists living in Loma Linda live longer? I mean, the Adventist health study has just gone uh, on and on and on and on. It shows almost every kind of cancer you can imagine is way less if you follow the, the biblical diet. Uh, heart disease is way less if you follow the biblical diet. In fact, Adventists who carefully follow the biblical diet and, and with some additions from, made by Ellen White live on an average 10 years longer than the general population. That's a big difference. Yeah. Now. I want to say something. A lot of the young people who might be listening here will say, well, you know, do I want to spend an extra 10 years in the nursing home, you know, with someone poking food down my face and, you know, wiping my bottom and all that kind of stuff? That's not what we're talking about. The 10 years more that you get is in the middle of, the, of your life at the healthy part of your life. The people who don't follow that diet, they start deteriorating 10 years younger. Yeah. We just had so, we just had a gentleman turn 103 in this district just this last week. Mm -hmm. You know, they, there's some people are pointing out that it may not just be the diet. Maybe the fact that we take off a day and oh, let's take worship oh. God and worship God and totally and doing. kind of unwind that that might be a a good why not reason for it, it too. Part and that should be a package. part of it. Mm -hmm. Well. What have Adventist evangelists done with Daniel 1 and Daniel 2 over the years? Well, it's a centerpiece. Yeah, it's centerpiece. A, often it's the, it's the first night, isn't it? Big attraction for the Big first attraction night. to get people started and coming and getting interested in the series and so forth. Well, and honestly, thousands of people have been baptized who were first attracted to the truth to the reading of Daniel 2. And what, what do we see in Daniel 2? We don't obviously have time to read it or to go to great detail, but Nebuchadnezzar saw that great idol, that great image in his vision, didn't he? Yeah. And the head was made of what? Gold. Gold, and the chest and, bronze, the, and, the chest and arms are made of silver. silver, and the belly and thighs are made of bronze, uh, and the legs are made of Iron. iron, and then the feet were made of iron and clay, right? Yep. So he saw that thing, but then what happened to his wisdom about what, his understanding of the vision? Forgot it. He couldn't remember what he had dreamt. So what did he do? Hold out his magicians and soothsayers and ask them. And were they able to answer it? No, they no. tried to divert and, and s finally said, Nobody's ever asked anybody to do this kind of thing. <laughs> Tell us the vision and we can interpret it, but don't, mm -hmm. don't ask us to come up with it from scratch. Okay. Only the gods can do that. Do you think he really forgot it, or did he get the wisdom in his head that, hey, these guys can fake it? If they really had the power that they say they do. They can, they can tell me what my dream was. You forget most of your dreams. I think he really yeah. forgot it. Well, I don't dream. 
I don't you forget don't all about, of them. You don't dream about those things? Well, I don't forget all my the only, dreams. The only no. dreams that you remember are the ones just before you wake up. I know, but what makes you um, hot to, to figure out what it is for all that time yeah. if you forget it? Well, anyway, that's the point. What happened? Imagine if you were in your room with Daniel and his three friends, probably at the end of a day, thinking about, okay, what are we going to have for, for, to eat and so forth? And here comes someone and said, you are one of the wise men, and the king has just declared that all of you are supposed to be put to death. Mm -hmm. How would you respond? Well, Daniel went asked for save the king, and he went and explained. He said, give us, give us some time, give us a day. Save us. We'll consult and we'll, we'll, we'll get to the answer. And of course, we know that Daniel was able to, the, he had the same dream and he remembered it and he went and he explained everything to Nebuchadnezzar and was given great uh, privilege and honor from that. Now there's, along with that thing and, and just to, to just connecting Daniel 2 with later parts of Daniel, which we won't spend as much time on this evening, Daniel 7 to 12, we realize that, Dan, that God has predicted here something starting from the days of Nebuchadnezzar, 615 or 600, well, he was actually born probably around 630 B.C. Did that, that first dream, Daniel 2, when does it end? Sometime in the future. When Christ comes. At least Christ, Christ comes, Christ comes in, in, on into the future. He's going to rule forever, isn't he? Mm -hmm. See? So how can God predict things that far in advance? He's God. Okay, and that's precisely the point. If you read Isaiah 40 to 55, when you got a moment, doesn't take a long time to read those chapters, you'll see that God repeatedly challenges these foreign gods. Okay, if you think you're a God, predict the future, create out of nothing. Bam. Okay? Show me what you can do. No response. The real God can create out of nothing and he can predict. We know that it, at the end of Daniel he predicted precisely something that was going to happen more than 2300 years later. Well, when Daniel appeared before Nebuchadnezzar with this information, what did he say? Well, king, I did a good job. I got the answer for you. What did he say? God showed me. God showed me the true God, the God of heaven, showed me what you want, what you need to know. So that's a humble approach, and it was an approach that worked. In our daily activities, and especially when we seek to evangelize by sharing our faith, do we take a humble attitude? Do people see that we are witnessing for God? Do they praise God because of what we say? Remember what it says in Matthew 5, verse 16? In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise who? Your Father in heaven. Your Father in heaven. Wow, how good, do we, how good are we at doing that? Paul felt that he, he could only boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 6.14. So look at the next major story in chapter 3 of Daniel. And what happened there? Nebuchadnezzar decided to make a statue of all of gold. Since all of gold. he was gold. the head of gold, and yes. the other one, he would just make the whole thing himself. Mm -hmm. And what was supposed to happen there on the plain of Dura? Everybody bowed down. Everybody was supposed to show up and bow down when the music sounded, right? And what did happen? Most everybody bowed down. Most everybody bowed down. And who didn't? Daniel and his friends. Well, yeah. Daniel was probably somewhere else. He yeah, Daniel must have been mission. somewhere else. But we know that the three friends were there, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. And they refused to bow down, and when the king called them, what did they say? 
we can't. We <laughs> Sorry, won't King. Even if you, whatever you do to the, hot, to the oven, we don't care. It doesn't matter. We respect you as king, but <clears throat> we will not worship your idol. And the king became furious. And he threw them into the, he, he, had, he arranged for them to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And how hot was it? Killed some of the. It killed the people who threw them in. Yes. It was so hot. And the king looked in there. What did he see? Four people. Well, he put three in there, and there was four walking around. Four walking around. And the, the, the King James says the fourth was the Son of God. Looked like the Son of God. Now, did Nebuchadnezzar have a picture of him, Jesus, somewhere in his studio? How do we know it was the Son of God? The Hebrew actually says he looks like a divine being. A son of the gods is what it says literally in Hebrew. He recognized that wasn't just like all the other three guys in there. This person was somebody really special. Well, do you think anything like that fiery furnace thing could ever happen again? Well, if you look at the time we're living in now, they've been burning people. They, well, they burn people at the stake during the yeah, dark ages. That's right. There's a very interesting passage in Revelation 13. See if this sounds at all familiar. Then I saw another beast which came up out of the earth. This is Revelation 13:11 and following. It had two horns like a lamb's horns, and it spoke like a dragon. It used the vast authority of the first beast in its presence. It forced the earth and all who live in it to worship the first beast whose wound had healed. Does that sound a little like the plain of Dura? This second beast performed great miracles and made fire came down out of heaven to the earth in sight of everyone. And it deceived all the peoples living on earth by means of the miracles which it was allowed to perform in the presence of the first beast. The beast told them to build an image in honor of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image uh, could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. Does that sound like Daniel 3? The beast forced all the people, small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to have a mark placed on their right hands or on their foreheads. No one could buy or sell without having this mark. That is, the beast's name or the number that stands for the name. So, could that happen again? Mm -hmm. Sounds very similar, doesn't it? Well, what would you have said if Nebuchadnezzar said to you, you better bow down or you will be thrown into the burning fiery furnace? What did they do? What, what would, would you have said? Well, I hope I would have the courage to say what these guys did. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't bow down to that. Or to be gone, or to arrange to be gone. You, you hope you would say that? Well... I mean, I haven't been in that exact position, so I can't absolute guarantee. Well, that's true. But you know, when you are in that position, God would give you words to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what if they had not been preserved? Would it have still been the right thing to do? Well, it's happened yes. a lot. Yes, I think so. A lot in the future. A lot afterwards. People burned at the stake, and they weren't, they didn't come through. Over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen these things with ISIS mm -hmm. beheading and killing uh, oh Christian types. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. There's a story told about a group that um, a few years ago was called to be missionaries in Zaire, which is the Congo now. And they were supposed to travel up there. And uh, someone says, before you go, stop and spend a little time with us, and or a day or two. So they said, OK, we'll come and spend a couple of days with you there. They turned around when they were ready to go, and they realized that, that some whole area that they should have been traveling in when, if they had not stayed, got blown up by the, all the people fighting over there. So God still takes care of people. Absolutely. Okay, so Daniel 3 ends with Nebuchadnezzar making a great confession about the true God. 
But it was long, long thereafter that he made the statement found in Daniel 4, verse 30. He said, look how great Babylon is. I built it as my capital city to display my power and might, my glory and majesty. Okay? So, I think that was the one I was supposed to have given you, Dennis. Was that it? No? The next one. Um, yes, Daniel 6, 4 to 5. Okay. Then the other supervisors and the governors tried to find something wrong uh, with the way Daniel administered the empire, but they couldn't because Daniel was reliable and did not do anything wrong or dishonest. They said to one another, we are not going to find anything of which to accuse Daniel unless we, it is something in connection with his religion. Okay. I'm, I think I made a mistake there. Yeah. That was mine. Yeah. Jackie, were you supposed to read the ones upon Mark? Or was that you, Carrie? Carrie. Yeah. That was okay. Carrie. It's mine. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go with it. The once proud monarch had become a humble child of God. The tyrannical, overbearing ruler, a wise and compassionate king. He who had defied and blasphemed the God of heaven now acknowledged the power of the Most High and earnestly sought to promote the fear of Jehovah and the happiness of his subjects. Under the rebuke of him who is King of kings and Lord of lords, Nebuchadnezzar had learned at last the lesson which all rulers need to learn, that true greatness consists in true goodness. He acknowledged Jehovah as the living God, saying, quote, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase, unquote. From Prophets and Kings, page 521, paragraph 2. Okay, so what led to that great change in his attitude? Well, he was eating grass Seven for a years. of years. Yes. You wonder what changed in his digestive system that made him possible to live like an animal. Yeah. For seven years. Amazing. Well, do you think you do you think we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven? Hope so. I think there's a chance. Yeah. After that paragraph, you think there might be a pretty good chance, huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, we've talked about that a little bit, and in, in, in the book of Daniel, we see that the wisdom and faithfulness of him uh, 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 led him to a top position for the gov in the government of Babylonia. Then when Babylonia was conquered by the Medes and Persians, it was not long before he was in a top position in that government. That is an almost unheard of thing. So what do we know about Daniel that might help us to explain why, he, why that was? And Dennis has already read us his passage from Daniel 6. Um, they said, There's not, we can't find anything wrong with this Daniel except maybe in connection with his religion. So what was it that Daniel did? They thought they could catch him doing? Praying. Three times a day. Three times a day. He would go back to his room. Apparently he would open the windows and bow down and pray toward Jerusalem. Okay? So what, was it, what happened? Is that what we should do? Well, we, we're no longer told to pray toward Jerusalem. We don't have to do that anymore after Christ died and the, the some, some people pray towards Mecca yes well, that's east from here and so is Jerusalem east of their relation yeah. face west Very close. <laughs> you know that might still have a little relationship to people you know br bringing dirt over and, and praying on that only now they're they're looking towards the place <coughs> now yeah so but now we know that God is is God okay. over everything. Let me, let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you think Daniel knew about this decree? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, yeah. And what did he do? What he'd always done. He didn't change anything. I mean, why couldn't he have just not opened the window? He could have called, couldn't he have prayed in the quiet somewhere? Played in the corner. <coughs> uh, Jesus said, pray in their closet. And what God hears in, in, the, in the quiet, in the closet, he, he, will, he will make open, make available to the public. 
Oh, he could have prayed at some other time when they weren't watching. He didn't do that. He could have offered his prayer silently and inconspicuously, even while he's working. So why does he need to go and open the windows and pray toward Jerusalem? I think he just knew the situation was challenging, challenging God. And to do anything else would just, he would lose a little bit. And lose why would he want to lose? Well, he could still pray with the thing closed, you know, and so in that way you're losing, you're winning a little bit, but why not win the whole thing and open up every, open up the windows and do it like before? I think he, you are such a great God and you are worthy of all that I have to offer and you're more important to me than mm -hmm. any of this. Mm -hmm. And that made a big statement when he kept and he opened that window. Sure. I'm sure that when we get to heaven, we're going to find out that there's a lot more to the story of Daniel than what we have in this book. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Daniel had daily experiences with God. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, if God is on my side, if I'm on God's side, I don't have anything to worry about. He had a very close relationship with God. And, and we know just a few examples of, of the way that God had protected him. Well, so, Jackie, I think you can add some, something to that discussion. Oh, the big one. All right. Okay. The prophet's enemies counted on Daniel's firm adherence to principle for the success of their plan. And they were not mistaken in their estimate of his character. He quickly read their malignant purpose in framing the decree, but he did not change his course in a single particular. Why should he cease to pray now when he most needed to pray? Rather would he relinquish life itself than his hope of help in God. With calmness he performed his duties as chief of the princes, and at the hour of prayer he went to his chamber. And with his windows open toward Jerusalem, in accordance with his usual custom, he offered his petition up to the God of heaven. He did not try to conceal his act. Although he knew full well the consequences of his fidelity to God, his spirit faltered not. Before those who were plotting his ruin, he would not allow it even to appear that his connection with heaven was severed. In all cases where the king had a right to command, Daniel would obey. But neither the king nor his decree could make him swerve from allegiance to the king of kings. Thus the prophet boldly, yet quietly and humbly declared that no earthly power has a right to interpose between the soul and God. Surrounded by idolaters, he was a faithful witness in his truth. This, his dauntless adherence to right was a bright light in the moral darkness of that heathen court. Daniel stands before the world today, a worthy example of Christian fearlessness and fidelity. For an entire day, the princes watched Daniel. Three times they saw him go to his chamber, and three times they heard his voice, lifted in earnest intercession to God. Becky, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. What language do you think he was praying in? Probably Hebrew. Hebrew. Would they understand Hebrew? They might understand some of it. Maybe they, they had would a have translator been, there, an interpreter. They would have spoke Aramaic. Yeah. And one linguist told me that it's like the difference between Spanish and he and, and uh, Portuguese. Portuguese. Yeah. Quite a bit alike. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they saw what they wanted. Okay, go ahead. The next morning, they laid their complaint before the king. Daniel, his most honored and faithful statesman, had set the royal decree at defiance. Hast thou not signed a decree, they reminded him, that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, <laughs> shall be cast into the, the den of lions. Prophets of Kings, mm. 540 to 542. So I'm sure at that point in time, they said, yeah, 
We, we got we've got him. him. There's nothing he can do. Well, what was the result? Lion's Den. The Lion's Den. And Daniel got thrown into the Lion's Den, even though Nebuchadnezzar tried to do everything he could to try to protect him. Yeah. Not thrown in, I'm sorry. Darius. It was Darius this time, I'm sorry, <coughs> not Nebuchadnezzar. Um, tried to preserve him, but he couldn't, so off he went. And w what was the final result? When they yeah. came early the next morning? King had had a very sleepless night. Yeah. He rushed down to see if he was still alive, and he was. And he was. They yeah. pulled him out. And then what happened? The bad guys went in. <laughs> All the snakes went in the was, pit. Is this uh, God's way of thinning out the, <sighs> the evil ones? <laughs> God didn't tell them that. It was the other, other people threw yeah. them in. <laughs> well, okay. Gary? As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies recorded by Daniel demand our special attention as they relate to the very time in which we are living. With them should be linked the teachings of the last book of the New Testament scriptures. Satan has led many to believe that the prophetic portions of the writings of Daniel and of John the Revelator cannot be understood. But the promise is plain that special blessings will accompany the study of these prophecies. The wise shall understand, Daniel 12:10 was spoken of the visions of Daniel that were to be unsealed in the latter days and of the revelation of Christ gave to his servant John for the guidance of God's people all through the centuries. The promise is, blessed is, that, is he that readeth and they that hear the word of this prophecy and keep the, the, those things which are written therein. Revelation 1.13. That's from Prophets and Kings. Actually, it's Revelation 1, 3. Oh. Prophets and Kings, 547 to 548. Okay? So, does God expect us... Oh, what about it? Is, this, is, is the book of Daniel still sealed, or should we be able to understand it today? I don't know. It seems like sealing could be in layers. Okay. As time has gone by, people have unsealed certain in certain ways, and as time goes by, they unseal it a different way yet. So, there might be all kinds of seals there. Okay. Well, we know that the book of Daniel is, is divided almost right in the middle between the first half is mostly historical material, and the second half is mostly prophecies. So, when you read the book of Daniel, or hear about the, when someone mentions Daniel, what do you think of? Do you think of the lion's den and the, 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 the fiery furnace, or do you think of the 2300 days and uh, the prophecies? What, what comes to mind first? Well, the stories are repeated so much that you remember those. But uh, the late Dr. Leslie Harding had mm -hmm. the idea, or expressed the idea that the Prophecies told us about the last days. The stories told us how to live in the last days. Okay, fair enough. Now, is it true that the originally those that book was written in two languages? Yes. So yeah. it was it divided in half as far as those languages go? No, no. Um, what happened was this: and Dan it starts out in Hebrew, and in, in Daniel two verse four where he's coming to explain to the king the answer about what happened so forth. He says, O king, live forever, etc. He's, of course, he's now speaking to the king, so he has to speak Aramaic. So he, he jumps to Aramaic at that point and continues in Aramaic until chapter 7. And now when he's prophesying stuff far in the future, and he's not dealing with, he's in Persia now, he's not in Babylon anymore, he goes back to Hebrew. 
So two through two through te seven, more or less, and are in Aramaic, and then chapter one, and the first couple of two three verses of chapter two, and then seven and the rest of the book were in Hebrew. Okay, that little section. That's when he's talking to the it's Babylonians. The, the Aramaic starts when he's talking to the ba to, to the Babylonians. Is it and he end too? He stays. He stays with Aramaic until he's finished with the Babylonians. Oh, okay. Well, that's like using all caps and <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Daniel, we're going to we're going to discover as we read on that prophecy, the, the prophecies of Daniel take us down all the way to the modern time. 170 some years ago, 1844. Well, there's something interesting about what happened there. Um, Daniel was very concerned about that pro that long time period because of what? What was his concern about? Do you remember? His concern was about God's reputation. Yeah, when and Israel was going to be or Judah going to be restored. That was okay, well, how did he learn that? From uh, was it Jeremiah? Yeah. Jeremiah's prophecy. <coughs> How do you think Daniel got a copy of Jeremiah's prophecy? Smuggled. Smuggled? Maybe. There must have been communication between the two. Because Jeremiah had the opportunity of, of actually retiring to Babylon. Yeah, and visiting. Chose to stay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well. Was Jeremiah the only prophet around in those days, back in Judah? Well, there could have been a lot of them. It's just that they didn't write anything that survived. Do we, we know? No do we know specifically about any prophecies? Uh, there's. I think there were any other I prophets. Can't, I can't remember names, but I think there were. Look at Jeremiah 25, I believe it's verse 10 or somewhere there, if I can get my computer to go there. And it's a little bit further down. Uh, Oh, I thought I had this nailed down here. Verse 11 is about the 70 years. Okay, let's look at that first. Thank you. And so then because you, verse 8, then because you would not listen to him, the Lord Almighty says, I'm going to send for all the peoples from the north and for my servant King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. Whose servant? God's servant. God's servant. I'm going to bring them to fight against Judah and its inhabitants and against all the neighboring nations. I'm going to destroy this nation and its neighbors and leave them in ruins forever, a terrible and shocking sight. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will silence their shouts of joy and gladness and the happy sounds of wedding feasts. They will have no oil for their lamps and there will be no more corn. This whole land will be left in ruins and will be a shocking sight and the neighboring nations will serve the king of Babylonia for? 70 years. 70 years. Okay, and is that the only place where that's mentioned? Well, Daniel 9, that's where Daniel was reading and he saw that 70 years was almost up. Okay, but what happened to, da to Jeremiah as he's making, he making these predictions? You remember? Wasn't he taken to Egypt? Well, that was later. That later. But even as he was making these predictions, there were a bunch of false prophets standing around and said, no, 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 that's not going to happen. Never, never, never here. No. Um, chapter 29, verse 10, the Lord says, when Babylonia's 70 years are over, I will show my concern for you and keep your, my promise to bring you back home. I alone know the plans I have for you, plans to bring you prosperity and not disaster, plans to bring about the future you hope for. Then you will call to me, you will come and pray to me, and I will answer you. You will seek me, and you will find me, because you will seek me with all your heart. And, but if you read the context here, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take time to 
to get out here. But you find out that there are people even d directly denying Daniel, I mean, uh, Jeremiah's vision. So Daniel looks at that and he says, this is, somehow he knows this is a true prophecy of God. And he says, Lord, the time is almost up. The seven years are almost finished. And I don't see any progress toward our restoring our land. What are you going to do? Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I think you have a part of that. Uh. Gordon? From Daniel 9, mm -hmm. verses 15 to 19. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Daniel's prayer. O Lord, our God, you showed your power by bringing your people out of Egypt, and your power is still remembered. We have sinned. We have done wrong. You have defended us in the past, so do not be angry with Jerusalem any longer. It is your city, your sacred hill. All the people in the neighboring countries look down on Jerusalem and on your people because of our sins and the evil our ancestors did. O oh God, hear my prayer and pleading. Restore your temple, which has been destroyed. Restore it so that everyone will know that you are God. Listen to us, O God. Look at us and see the trouble we are in and the suffering of the city that bears your name. We are praying to you because you are merciful, not because we have done right. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us and act. In order that everyone will know that you are God, do not delay. The city and these people are yours. Wow, what kind of an appeal is that? So what's, what's, he, what's, he, what's he asking God to do? Take us back to Jerusalem. Fulfill his promise. promise. Yeah. Instead of yeah. just saying, oh, hey, let's throw a party because God's going to do it no matter what. He enters into prayer to bring about the result. He does two things that are really important. One, he does not separate himself from the people. He says our sins. We, we, we have sinned. We have done wrong and so forth like this. And then he says, God, do something not because we're righteous, not because we've done anything right, but for what reason? Your reputation. It's your people, <laughs> your reputation, your city. People are looking down on, you know, God, it's you. It's not us, it's you. I think that's an incredibly powerful point that he's making there. You're asking about other prophets. Nahum overlapped and mm -hmm. Zephaniah yeah. was during Jeremiah's time. Habakkuk and, of course, Ezekiel and Daniel. And, and yeah, those are the good prophets, but there was a whole lot of, a whole lot of yeah. false prophets also. Yeah. Well, when Daniel received a copy of Jeremiah's prophecy, how did he know that it was inspired? You ever thought about that? Remember in those days, you didn't get a Bible that was nicely bound up and it says the Word of God on the cover and so forth. You got a scroll. By reading it and analyzing it, comparing it with the writings of Moses and with other things that you know are inspired. Okay. And also, you know, if he was a man of prayer, God would have testified that this was... Mm -hmm. This was good. This was from me. I think the spirit would have, would have guided him to the right good. places. Are we prepared to stand firm and true to the truth? Are we ever tempted to compromise with the truth even in small ways in our lives today? If we are compromising now, will it be easy, even easier for, to make larger compromises later? What kind of results do you think we will see in the kingdom of heaven for people like Daniel? I mean, how many people has his stories, even at the time when he was alive and then all the years since, how many people have been influenced by Daniel's story? Hundreds and thousands. Yeah. Just an incredible thing. I mean, he's gonna, his, his crown is going to be so heavy he can hardly stand up, I'm sure. <laughs> I don't know, God's got to figure out that somehow or other. Well, an enormous number of people have been influenced, not just by at that time, but all the years since. 
Well, there's a very interesting passage in Luke, coming over the New Testament, chapter 14, 26 to 27. Those who come to me cannot be my disciples unless they love me more than they love father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and themselves as well. Those who do not carry their own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. What do you think he's trying to say to us? We should put God first. Okay. Is it easy to witness to the members of your own family, those who may not be Christians? No. It is not. not. But our power comes in prayer for them, not in convincing or Do we any other way. It's, it's mm -hmm. the power of God. Open their heart, because mm -hmm. their heart is an open... Um, if we live loving, caring, honest, faithful lives, does that make it easier to witness? Does it make it easier to talk to people about, about God? That is a witness. Yeah. And they'll, they'll either steal their heart against it or they'll be drawn to it. They're either drawn to the light or we mm. turn from the light. In our day, is it easy to have the kind of relationship that Daniel had, do you think? How would it impact us if we had one of those kind of experiences in our own lives? Well, we have so many more materials available to us to tell us about what God is like. I mean, we have not just the New Testament, but the writings of Ellen White, plus all the rest of the Old Testament that Daniel didn't have. Why do you think so many people want to reject, even Christians, biblical scholars want to reject the book of Daniel? Because it, it says that God can predict the future. So many, many scholars, just a priori, say not even God himself can predict the future. So those predictions of Daniel, no, they, they, they can't be true. They must have been written after it happened. But that's a problem. Why is that, why is that a huge problem for them? Some things still haven't happened. There's, some of the prophecies extend, several of them extend all the way to the second coming of Jesus. Are you, are you going to try to claim that Daniel wasn't written until after the second coming of Jesus? That's a little bit far-fetched, isn't it? So what do they usually, usually claim? Well, they have a different way to interpret everything, and they think that most of the prophecies in Daniel were actually finished by the days of, of uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and around about 160 yeah. B.C. They interpret the statue as uh, the silver is Mede, the Medes and the belly is Persians and, and the, the legs are, are Greece. Yeah. And yeah. it does away with Rome altogether because that would have in way in the future. Yeah, Rome, Rome didn't, Rome's demise didn't come until 476 A.D. Yeah. Well, look at Daniel 12, verse 9, and then we're going to come to a conclusion here. He answered, He must go, now, you must go now, Daniel, because these words are to be kept secret and hidden until the end comes. So, again, I ask, do we... Uh, is it all right for us to try to interpret the book of Daniel? Are we at the end? Well, in terms of witnessing, Jim, I think you have a comment there. It should be clear that you cannot antagonize and persuade at the same time. Holy lives lived and visible to those around us are powerful sermons. The unstudied, unconscious influence of a holy life is the most convincing sermon that can be given in favor of Christianity. Argument, even when unanswerable, may provoke only opposition, but a godly example has a power which is impossible wholly to resist. From Sketches from the Life, uh, Life of Paul by Ellen White. Mm -hmm. And some other places. In 1883 mm -hmm. following. 
I, one thing we haven't uh, dealt with, and that is Daniel 12, 1. Mm -hmm. Michael, the archangel, stands up, who has, uh, the RSV says, who has charge of your people, but the NIV says, your protector, and that one is stuck out with, with me. Mm -hmm. God is our protector of those that are willing to listen and take mm -hmm. instruction. So anyway, I like that uh, mm -hmm. verse, uh, very important. Well, in the book of Daniel, if we compare it with the book of Revelation, we can learn a lot of things about false worship. A lot, a lot of, of people trying to defeat and so forth. What, what things can we learn about false kinds of worship? Nauseating to the Lord. False worship is commanded by those who are not God. It is done in public places for all to see. Usually they want to show off. The authorities are watching to see if you obey or not. Does this sound like uh, Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the three worthies? You are not given a choice as to whether you will worship or not. And five, those in charge will try to kill you if you do not comply. And that's going to be true in the end, just as it was in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So as you review the stories, and prophecies from the book of Daniel, is it obvious to you how they are related to us in our day? In Daniel 7, we see a little horn making claims that he is to be worshipped. Is it clear who that is talking about? Seventh-day Adventists have been quite successful at reaching the less educated, poor, ordinary people with the messages of Daniel through evangelistic sermon series. Why have we been so much less successful in reaching out to the powerful, the wealthy, the highly educated, could we and should we do better? How are we going to reach those people? The people who think they know the answers, they think they know that Daniel can't be relied upon, they think they know that, ah, oh, the Bible is an ancient book, it's, it's for those people back then, it doesn't really have anything to do with us. If they I, reject it, they're rejecting the spirit of truth. And what, you know, you can't do anything about it. Yeah. Well, could we do anything to make it? more appealing well they don't have a yearning i don't know that you yeah. can yeah string some syllables together to make it any they different. need to understand that they need god and somehow we need to make that clear to them and that's our challenge and yours too a kind and wonderful father we thank you for these books from long ago three thousand years ago more than three thousand years ago here is material that we need to study, we need to learn about, we need to recognize the truths that are there so that we can serve you better. May we come to be more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.